All right, class. So we just talked about the HPG pathway, which includes the hypothalamus, talking to the anterior pituitary, and the anterior pituitary is talking to the gonads. The gonads are releasing sex steroid hormones like estrogen and androgens. And when we have enough of these hormones in the bloodstream, they target the anterior pituitary and also the hypothalamus via negative feedback inhibition loop. Okay. Now, the question is, what would happen to a woman's endogenous hormone profile if she's taking birth control pills? How is her HPG pathway disrupted? What complications can she have? And the second question is, can you think of other examples where a person might take an exogenous hormone? What can happen to their endogenous hormone profiles in that case? Okay, so we will talk about effect of birth control pills here. All right. So when a, when a woman is taking birth control pill, she is actually taking high levels of estrogen and progesterone, which are hormones produced by the ovaries in response to FSH and LH. So birth control, when a woman is taking birth control, she is taking high amounts of estrogen and progesterone. And these are hormones produced by the ovaries in response to FSH and LH. Now, when we have high, this is high actually, lot. Okay. So, if you take high levels of estrogen and progesterone, those hormones feed back to your hypothalamus as if they were your very own estrogen and progesterone coming from your own ovaries, right? So your hypothalamus will feel, oh my God, I have enough estrogen and progesterone. And how do you think your endogenous HPG pathway would respond to that? This would be a significant level of negative feedback inhibition in the form of that birth control pill. Endogenously, your hypothalamus would shut down the release of GnRH, so you will have no GnRH, and this would in turn shut down release of FSH and LH from the anterior pituitary. This means your ovaries are not going to respond to those hormones Therefore, no ovulation. So you're shutting this down. You're shutting this down. Therefore, in absence of FSH and LH, you are not ovulating. And if you're not ovulating, no pregnancy. This birth control pill is tricky. Sorry, the birth control pill is actually tricking us tricking our brain to think that, okay, I'm already pregnant and it would not be appropriate to ovulate again while being currently pregnant. And that's how birth control pills actually work. And um, what can happen if you just stop taking birth control? How will that affect you? Well, you can get pregnant. But it's not life-threatening though. Uh, can you think of other examples when someone is taking external or exogenous hormones? Yes, some people do take exogenous thyroid hormones. Some people take um, exogenous cortisol, a hormone that plays a role in HPA pathway. What can happen to a woman if she suddenly stops taking her birth control pills? Well, she might get pregnant. But what's the worst? that can happen to someone if he or she stops taking cortisol that they might feed on for months. Say a person is taking cortisol for some autoimmune disorders and all of a sudden he stops taking those pills. Well, it can be life-threatening. 
So other hormones that are given exogenously by physicians and if patients stop taking those, it could be life-threatening and the patient can die. So never ever do that. Okay. So we will talk about the thyroid and parathyroid glands now. We will start by looking at the anatomy of the thyroid gland and then we will see how thyroid hormone is actually produced. Okay, so looking at the thyroid gland, the thyroid gland is a bilobed structure and it is located just below the larynx or the voice box. Um, it has two lobes on either side of the trachea, which are connected together by an isthmus. Now, under the microscope, a thyroid gland looks like this. We have, col uh, we have thyroid follicles, which are these rounded structures. So, these are the thyroid follicles. And the follicles are filled with a proteinaceous lipid. The lip the, sorry, proteinaceous uh, a liquid and the proteinaceous liquid is called colloid. Surrounding the follicle, we have the follicular cells, as you see here. These are the follicular cells, and then there are other types of cells. Do you see in between? These cells are called parafollicular cells. Parafollicular cells. Parafollicular cells. Why am I talking about parafollicular cells? Because we will talk about the hormones released from the parafollicular cells. We will talk about that very soon. Okay. So, looking at the production of thyroid hormone, how cells actually produce thyroid hormones. So, we have blood here. This is blood. Okay. And then this is a thyroid follicle, big. And the follicle is lined by these cells. Do you see these cells? These cells are follicular cells. Okay. All right. So what do we see here? Now know that the follicular cells, which are these cells in blue, these cells get ingredients from blood to make a very, very large protein called thyroglobulin. So do you see thyroglobulin here? The thyroglobulin is actually produced within the follicular cells, so they are produced here, and then transported into the colloid. So the colloid has thyroglobulin. Okay, now the thyroid follicles or the follicle cells also actively accumulate iodide and secrete it into the colloid. So we have iodide here in the plasma. The iodide is taken up by the follicular cells and then secreted into the colloid here. So now iodide has moved into the colloid from the plasma. Iodide gets oxidized first. It gets oxidized by hydrogen peroxide, sorry, and then the iodide attaches to specific tyrosine residues on the thyroglobulin molecule and when the thyroglobulin has one iodide attached it's called monoiodal tyrosine if a thyroglobulin has two iodide attached it's called diiodal tyrosine and then one monoiodal tyrosine and one di di diiodotyrosine come together to form triiodothyronine or T3 which is a thyroid hormone. Two diiodothyrosines come together to form tetraiodothyronine which is also another thyroid hormone. So T3 and T4 those are your thyroid hormones. But remember, these T3 and T4 molecules are still bound to thyroglobulin. However, when the thyroid follicle is stimulated, so when there is a stimulus, TSH, when it's stimulated by TSH, the bound thyroglobulin is removed 
and T3 and T4 are released from the thyroid follicle into the plasma. Okay, so let's review this one more time. We have a lot of amino acids in blood plasma that are taken up by these follicular cells. The follicular cells uh, then make a long protein called thyroglobulin from the amino acids that they take up and they release the thyroglobulin into the colloid. So now we have thyroglobulin hanging in the colloid. The follicular cells also take up a lot of these iodide molecules and transport them to, into the colloid. Once inside the colloid, the iodide molecules get oxidized and the iodide molecules are attached to specific tyrosine residues on the thyroglobulin. That leads to the formation of two types of molecules, monoiodotyrosine and diiodotyrosine. When one monoiodotyrosine combines with one diiodotyrosine, we form T3. And when two diiodotyrosines come together, we form T4. Remember, T3 and T4, they are both bound to thyroglobulin until there is stimulation by TSH. Once TSH tells the thyroid follicle, hey, hey, it's time to release thyroid hormones, then these thyroglobulin molecules are uh, thyroglobulin molecules are kind of clipped off and T3 and T4 molecules are ultimately released into the plasma. All right. So, okay. So this, these two slides are pretty much explaining what I just talked about. So I'm not going over these two slides. You can all read and, you know, it's, a, it's just what I talked about. So you should be fine. Okay, some basic actions of thyroid hormones. Your textbook is pretty, uh, your textbook talks a lot about the actions of thyroid hormones. But for testing purpose, just know the basics here. Know that thyroid hormone is really important for maintenance of metabolism. It works to maintain a normal metabolic rate. That's the most important function. It increases rates of cellular respiration and it promotes maturation of the nervous system and also stimulates protein synthesis. But out of these, and I, I encourage you to learn the actions of thyroid hormones straight from the PowerPoint. Just know the four actions, that's it. And know that um, keeping your metabolic rate at a standard level, that's the most important function of the thyroid hormone. Okay, now do you remember we talked about the parafollicular cells? Okay, now the parafollicular cells release a hormone called calcitonin. So calcitonin is released by the parafollicular cells. Okay, now what's the function of calcitonin? Now let's say, let's look at this diagram here. Now if blood calcium level is high, so we are looking at high blood calcium level, what do we need to do? We need to get rid of the extra calcium, right? So when the blood calcium level is high, the parafollicular cells release a hormone called calcitonin. Calcitonin then works on the kidneys and regulates or tells the kidney to release more calcium into urine and that ultimately lowers blood calcium level. I'll stop here and then make another video.